Johanna Shigula, you know, I don't know how well people know her, but I, I mean, I know her work really well because I was a huge Fassbinder fan and she was kind of a muse for him. Um, she came in and she was like, you know, she thought this was all bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I remember Mark came up um, and said, he was trying to be, uh, you know, connect, and he was like, oh, uh, Ms. Shigul, I'm, I'm so honored to meet you. And she said, that's stupid. <laughs> you know, she, she was pretty hardcore. the beauty of the New York City subway. <laughs> it took me an, an hour and 20 minutes to get from the West Village here. And at the end, it was so full of people, we ran. I, I, we got out of the car and ran. So thanks for waiting. <laughs> Hope you enjoyed the movie. I'm, you know, I'm impressed. I don't know how many people were here, but it, you stayed. That's sweet. <laughs> I'm impressed. <laughs> We were talking about it. We were, I was getting some feedback from them. They all loved it, and we got some good questions to ask you. Okay. But the, so the first thing is, we were just talking. I, I was just making the point about for four decades or so, the humanity that you bring to your work. And I've heard before you, when when you've when you've heard in other interviews, um, your character Baxter uh, Godwin described as a mad scientist. You push back on that. No, I get upset because. You know, it misidentifies him, and also it closes it down. You know, it's it's what the film fights against, you know, uh, kind of uh, accepting certain things and not uh, seeing with your own eyes and, and, and experiencing something and developing some kind of, um, you know, discernment that's not... Uh, given to you, that's not given to you by society, and then you just roll over and say, well, that's the way it is, that's the truth. And the beauty of this movie is her, you know, not only her finding her way, but in general, um, you know, this idea of without social conditioning, she becomes like a, a truth teller. Uh, she's an innocent, but she's also the wisest person in the world because she's she's seen things, and she's seen through things that we take for granted and, and given, and they oppress us. So, you know, it's very much a story about her love of life and her entering the world without all that oppression. You know, uh, a lot is made of the sex and all that, but that's part of it. But for me, um, that's not what this film is about. It's about ways of seeing and uh, freedom, uh, you know, personal liberation. Thank you. I wanted to actually ask about you as a as a movie fan, because there's been a lot of I mean your your career all of your career, but especially lately these great workflows you've gotten in with Robert Eggers, The Lighthouse, and you're working with him again, uh, Wes Anderson, Sean Baker, The Florida Project, so many. Uh, you were a big fan of this director of Yorgos Lanthimos. Yeah, I was. Um, you know, I always think because I, I think I grew up as a theater actor and and. That's what I was for many years, and that was my identity. Even though I was working in movies, I was spent more time in the theater, at least at the beginning. And the other day, I did this thing for Criterion, where you go in their closet, and they've got all the uh, DVDs, and then you comment on them. I was a little scared I'd be exposed for not knowing movies or having a very shallow film culture, but I guess I've been around long enough that... I started, I, you know, I had, I had seen a lot of them, and I also had a connection with a lot of them. Um, yeah, I watched Yorgos Lanthimos' movies. Uh, they were on my radar. Uh, I didn't see them all since then. I've seen them all. Uh, he's, uh, he's, you know, got a special voice. And I think, you know, because, because like, the favorite was his first English language movie, you see that, and whenever you see a beautiful movie, you think, oh, I'd like to work with that person. But there was a little distance because he's working in Greek and he's working in other languages, and, 
And I think, oh, I, I appreciate it, but I don't think I'll ever get to work with him. And then I saw The Favorite, which, um, you know, then that made me think, oh, he's working in English and he's working on a, a different uh, scale. Um, not that that bothers me and makes plenty of small movies. But um, so, so when he called me up with Emma together on the phone, not totally out of the dark. I mean, someone said, they're, they're going to call you. And I was like, really? Cool. Um, you know, I was good to go because I loved his movies. And uh, I've always, you know, really liked Emma and thought she was talented. So then when they told me the story, I thought, that's, that's cool. I've heard you mention that uh, when they called you that day, uh, there was a portrait of your dad. Um, and tell us about your dad. <laughs> well, I, I, I mentioned it because I looked around me and I thought, yeah, I'm right to do this. Um, I was in uh, this little, my study basically in uh, New York. And when they were calling me, I noticed that behind me was a, pic uh, was a portrait of my father. I don't have a crazy thing about my father, but I did a film once where they painted a portrait for him, you know, for the story. And they gave it to me at the end. And it's quite good because it's taken from a photograph. So I put it up there. And then over here is a big photograph, a huge photograph, of uh, Marina Abramovich doing an autopsy on a nude woman. And I see that. I see the father. I see the autopsy. I grew up in a medical family. I grew up around labs. I grew up around instruments and blood and all that kind of business. So I thought, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm ready to do this. I, I, I have a little background in this. <laughs> and actually, the, the, the sewing, like when you actually sew the money into her, those are your hands doing that. They are. And what, what was funny is uh, it's a very minor uh, moment. Um, so I don't know whether you remember. You just saw the film. But I've got these fake thumbs on, you know? And it was really difficult. But we had, they, they hooked us up. There, there was a rehearsal period that I, I can talk about a little later, but one of the things that we did besides our rehearsal period together was Rami and I were working with a woman that worked at the morgue. She was very cool. Um, and she taught us certain things about autopsy, taught us how to cut. Um, you know, we were using the period, uh, you know, uh, instruments that we would, we would use in the uh, movie. And uh, where, where am I going with this? To help me out. I'm, I'm still in the traffic, the, uh, guys. But huh? the sewing of the... Oh, yeah, um, the sewing. And we learned how to suture. And then it was time to do that. And we even had a guy, a tailor, who was going to do it. But he couldn't do it. <laughs> so I had to step in with those fake thumbs and do it. But obviously, uh, I mean, I did it okay. Yeah, <laughs> But it was... It was uh, it was something that, thank God, we practiced it because that kind of stuff can really um, take forever. And it, it breaks your heart because you can get hung up, as you know, uh, hung up with prop stuff. and Because it, it was a little detail that had to be yeah. done. Yeah. Well, you know, you mentioned Marina Abramovich. And you know that uh, I was one of the lucky ones. It was 10 years ago this week at the Park Avenue Armory Oh, you saw... Uh, I saw you uh, and her do, and um, it was great seeing you he's there. He's talking about a show, a, a Robert Wilson theater show that uh, uh, Bob Wilson, uh, uh, about Marina Brown. The, the, the yeah. life and death of Marina. Yeah, I mean, yeah. she's still alive, but the, uh, it, was, it was a very heightened... It, it, was, it was a great experience. It was thrilling. But I wanted to ask, and I, not to make you talk about the makeup too much. Yeah, yeah, no, we can. But talk I did. I mentioned to the crowd because we were talking about your your past work, all of all the great stuff, and I mentioned Bobby Peru. Uh, yeah, <laughs> from Wild at Heart with the teeth. <laughs> yes, yes. And you said that that kind of that helped you understand that that character. Not even understand. It made me become that character. Mm. Um, uh, I guess we're talking about triggers that you have. You know, yeah. external things that make you able to access things that you can't access intellectually that they just make you feel a certain way and something comes out. It's, it's a part of your imagination that's lying dormant. And that's an excellent example because when I, I don't know how many of you saw Wild at Heart or remember that character, but it was a very cool character, I thought. Um, 
Uh, and I had double dentures. And when I, the dentures went over my teeth. Um, so I couldn't close my mouth. So all the time I was like this. And if you do that, he's, he's a sleazy guy, you know. If you do that, you all of a sudden feel like, you know, you want to chew on something or you want to do something nasty, you know. And, and that was a key. You can't think that. You can't plan that, you know. Um, so when you work with a mask or external things, in this case, obviously a heavy makeup job and, and some uh, body prosthetics, it changes how you feel. It changes how you look. You don't recognize yourself. You don't move the same way. And that's beautiful because it opens the door to pretending. It opens the door to being another person or, or imagining uh, a different way of moving, living, being. And, you know, that's a gift because you, it, it doesn't come from, uh, you know, plotting it out. It's, it's a very natural thing, organic. And even though it's it, you know, you did uh, go through the hours to get it all on. You know, this is like the first time in a Yorgos movie with that kind of makeup. He doesn't like it usually. No, he's usually. In fact, I, I remember I, I was working on Aquaman with Nicole Kidman, and she worked with him on this film, uh, Killing of the Sacred Deer. Yeah. And many of his earlier movies were famous for being um, very uh, kind of deadpan performing not you know it's hard to describe but i think i can give you the general idea if you don't know the movies you know just not very expressive and and nicole said you know what he's gonna do he's gonna tell you to stop acting stop acting stop acting he hates acting <laughs> but the truth is this is a slightly different movie and um you know, you can have your cake and eat it too. You can be rooted and still act, but it's it's elevated language. It's another period, uh, so it is quite theatrical for mm. what he normally does. But we also saw that in the favorite. Well, I, um, so in Budapest, uh, where the the film was shot, and I had mentioned that it was about ninety five percent of it was done on sound stages and in sets. And a lot was built. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of fantastic things, and the post on it was very long but it was incredible um well so you're mostly in the london scenes but how much were you did you were you able to visit uh, yeah i was, I was. <laughs> go across the street to to uh, yeah we did you know uh, go over to lisbon check it out it's really it's really cool and we did and i yeah i was i was mostly in my house and some exterior stuff but for example there's a little scene where we have a fight where i have to chloroform her in the carriage that was done actually uh, in Lisbon, uh, you know, we didn't see it, but I mean, uh, and then, but, you know, when we had some time, we'd go for a little walk, but it, it was very complete, and this stuff was really built, the, the detail on this set was incredible, like my house, my house was so beautiful, and I used to just wander around and look at stuff, you know, and, and you could open up books on the, on the, in the library, take them out, and, there would be period, um, you know, surgical uh, diagrams. So it was, it's when the world is so complete, it really tells you what to do, you know, because you don't, it's specific and it doesn't remind you of anything. So you have kind of fresh impulses because you got to throw out your impulses because you don't recognize anything. Um, so it's a, a beautiful gift. And the thing about Yorgos is, He's, he's, you know, he's really a polymath that he's very, he knows a lot about many things. So with each department, he's very connected and he really collaborates with them. And uh, so everything has a reason, everything has a purpose, everything's very, he's involved in it. So um, it, it's, you know, you have so much to work with. On, uh, uh, when the world is complete like that. In fact, I think that's the best thing a director can do yeah. is give you a complete world. Well, and on that point, because uh, he gives them a lot of freedom too to, to just try things. And you know, if it's not going to work, just try it anyway, the, his department heads. But what about with, uh, with the actors? Like, this is a great script. Beautiful. Yeah. But so you don't have to depart that much from it. But does he, does he want you to try something ad lib or? 
Ad lib, not so much, because the language, the syntax is, uh, you know, particularly hers, the way it's developed is very specific. And also mine, um, you know, besides an accent and written kind of a certain way, no, you don't want to mess with that. I'm not sure I could Im improvise, and nor would I want to. There was a wealth of stuff to do. It's, uh, you know, uh, uh, there was no reason to do that. Um, yeah. Uh, but he, uh, to answer your question, he gives you a setup, he sends you out, and uh, really lets you kind of go, observes, and, you know, pushes you a little this way, pushes a little that way. But there's not a lot of talking like, all right, now, what has to happen here? <laughs> you know, I mean, it's mostly uh, SAG people here, yeah? Okay, so you know this, but... Um, you know, I, I'm always impressed, and it hasn't changed. I've been working for a while, and it's always the same. You know, I'm always waiting to find that director that I always thought there was, but I've never worked with, that pulls you aside and has these long conversations about <laughs> psychology or what you need to do. I've never experienced that. <laughs> They're like, you know, get out there, do it, and I'll tell you if you're off base. He also, I think, knows what he's doing when he casts his his films, and so just to mention some—I mean, Mark Ruffalo uh, is hilarious, yeah. and and that and that's inspired because you know I've been doing some press with Mark, and he he laughs. He says, you know, it's such a departure departure from his sad dad roles, <laughs> you know, you know, kind of sensitive, you know, worried, you know, he's he, he's handsome, but. You know, he's got the kids, and you know, <laughs> it's not that. He really leaned into this, and, and the beautiful thing was when we were rehearsing, everybody was like, really? <laughs> and uh, then I, once we got to the place and it started to happen, it was like, yeah, yeah. Well, also, Rama Youssef is so sweet as uh, you share so many scenes with him. I did, and, you know, what you see is what you get. I mean, he, of course, it's a performance, but he's a very, um, I don't know if you know his comedy stuff, but smart, sweet, um, really thoughtful, really thoughtful, kind, wonderful, wonderful guy. There were, there were uh, see, I don't know how many people you actually got to Mark meet. is a louse. <laughs> No, no, just kidding. <laughs> I just wanted to point out, that because uh, the name is not that famous yet. Don't call but, me on that, please. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Catherine Hunter plays the, the brothel owner, and, and yeah, very nice. she's amazing. And, and uh, Hannah Shagula. Hannah uh, Shagula. So some, someone here wanted to ask if, uh, if you got a chance to meet her at all. You know, she... Oh, uh, just real quick. Um, <laughs> nothing's great, but... Um, uh, when we had these rehearsals, they were the very important. woman on the steam on the steamship. Yeah, uh, the old, the interesting old lady, you know, that hasn't had sex in twenty years and doesn't mind at all, you know, which is an you know, it's totally puzzling to uh, the Bella character. Um, okay, we we'd have these rehearsals, and what was interesting about it was. We played theater games. We didn't apply ourselves to the scene. Sometimes we'd use the text, but we used it abstractly. And it was beautiful because it got us used to the language and let us play with it and also helped us, you know, uh, memorize it and, and find rhythms and find music. But we didn't do the scenes. We didn't talk about character. We played theater games. And, you know, these were things that I thought, oh, I used to do this when I was young, you know. But they were conducted so beautifully um, by Yorgos that not only did he make company and uh, create a dynamic that was playful and people could fail in front of each other, and it also told us, gave us his language, his way of being. So it was, it was really, really useful. Well, there was the, that was mostly Rami, uh, uh, Emma, Mark, uh, and then other people would come in, but uh, the core of us was that. And uh, some of these other people would come in, like, for one day. And Hannah Shagola, you know, I don't know how well people know her, but I, I mean, I know her work really well because I was a huge Fassbinder fan, and she was kind of a muse for him. Um, she came in, and she was like, you know, she thought this was all bullshit. <laughs> 
and, and I remember Mark came up um, and said, he was trying to be, uh, you know, connect, and he was like, oh, uh, Ms. Shagul, I'm, I'm so honored to meet you. And she said, that's stupid. <laughs> you know, she, she was pretty hardcore. Um, but she works very well in the movie, and, you know, it's one of those things that um, I, because really, I, I, she uh, occupies a place in my head, so it's kind of one of those little pleasures where, did I ever think I'd be in a movie with Ch Hannah Shagula? No. But I is. <laughs> someone, someone from the audience asked me to ask you uh, about auditioning. Um, what was, maybe what was the last time you did it, and, and do you have any do you have any uh, advice for uh, for actors <laughs> on doing that? You know, to be honest, I auditioned very little because I was very lucky because I was a theater actor and people saw me at the theater and I started and it was an avant garde theater. It wasn't a commercial theater, so it was a, and that was my identity. You know, I was a downtown guy. You know, and I was. I mean, sure, I auditioned. I mean, for example, I put myself on tape for Spider-Man, you know. Uh, so I did, I did some of that, but not so much because normally I was at the theater and people would come to see me or, or after some movies, you know, you can say, look at the movies. So I didn't do so much uh, auditioning, not like a lot of people have. So I was fortunate. But the only thing I'd say is, and I experience this because I've been involved in the casting. I've been on the other side of the cat, not, I'm not, not as a director, but as an actor with the director looking at other actors. Just remember that the second you, I, I think you know this, but uh, the, the second you walk in the door, they figure things out in about three seconds. And so the best thing is you don't, you know, the most important thing, and maybe the most important thing about performing is just be present and uh, don't feel like you have to produce anything. Be there the best you can. Um, it's not just a case of uh, over-promising and, you know, underselling and all that. It's really, you know, for me, and I think for a lot of people in that casting process that when they're on the other side, if you feel too much need, you, uh, it repels you. Because you want someone to get there that you feel like can can take it, you know, can take it. And if they don't know where they're going or, or they're lost, they are not going to freak out and you can work with them. But if you feel like someone that needs too much and they're too much in your face, you know, some people like that, I guess. But that, that you're like, hmm, I don't know. Uh, be also because it seems egotistical. You know, it's like, look at me, look at me, look at me. And you got to take the edge off of that and just walk in and try to be with the people and connect, you know, in the most uh, basic, I'm saying really obvious things. Oh, no. <laughs> I tried. <laughs> well, let me just, as we... Uh, you know, sometimes you get home after doing a whole day of press and you go, oh <laughs> my God, I hate you. <laughs> as, as we... Uh, as we wrap up, I, you know, one of the reasons why you don't audition is because you do work with a lot of the same directors and they want to have you back. And how many movies? And I want to work with them, yeah. obviously. I, I, mean, I, I like that with, idea with of Wes repeating. Anderson, with, I, mean, I think I've been five Wes Andersons, probably six Abel Ferraras, uh, maybe six Paul Schraders, Paul Schrader. um, uh, Julian Schnabel, three, you know, yeah, I'm a, I'm a repeater. And it's great, like with Robert Eggers, you did the... Uh, the three, the, the, I'm on my third, yeah. And there was the lead in, the, the co-lead in Lighthouse, and then a smaller role, role in The, the Northman, yeah. and now Nosferatu. Yeah, which is, I don't play Nosferatu, but I play kind of a, it's a invented character, but it's uh, like the Van Helsing character. It's basically the learned man that helps them track down the Nosferatu. Interesting, given that your your history with Shadow of the Vampire, yeah, playing, yeah. playing the uh, <laughs> yeah. two sides. Yes. So uh, you and Emma and Yorgos made another movie. Yes, we did. And I'm very, very excited about it. A very different kind of movie. But they're, they're both wonderful. Um, yeah, I'm really excited. It's, it's more radical than this one. 
Yeah, not almost nothing is known about it, but it was shot in New Orleans, as I think is all that all that yes. we know. And it was funny because the the temporary title was and and you know we were shooting in New Orleans and you know there's a big working pl- class you know uh, uh, population there and I find really big movie fans and you know some of them maybe would know me from you know uh, Spider Man and things like that and. They'd see him on the street, and they're like, hey, Will, what are you doing here? And I'd say, I'm making a movie. And they'd say, the title was And, right? And they'd say, yeah, what's it called? And I'd say, And? And they'd say, yeah, but what's it called? <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I got into this uh, who's on first thing. Uh, and I finally, I learned my lesson and finally ended up with uh, untitled yet. <laughs> you know, I think but its its new title is uh, a a kind of kindness. Kinds of kindness. Kinds of kindness. K O K. K O K. Right. Right. Um, so, as we wrap, I the movie is opening. It opened yesterday. Yes. Uh, you know, it's it's. I think it's at nine theaters. Right. Uh, right. Locally, um, and some other in in L A. and Chicago, but it, it'll roll out. Uh, yeah. Yeah, and I mean, it, you know, I, I mentioned to the crowd that it, it was the winner of the Venice Film Festival, um, which is terrific. I know it's, and that was a, you know, that was a. You've been on film festival juries. That was a great jury that that loved this yeah. movie. Yeah. What? But as as it opens now and keeps, and it's going to be talked about through the whole next six months. What? What is? I mean, what is your feelings about the philosophy of the film? I mean, this is this is a movie that's set. Well, in a fantasy version of a hundred or so years ago, but we can learn a lot about this film about from today. So. I think so. I mean, and, and even so much of the comedy for me, anyway, is you see yourself in some of the ridiculous situations. I mean, like the classic thing of the second she wears out Wedderburn sexually, you know, and he 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 it becomes less sensual and more about a kind of romance or a kind of possession he gloms on to it you know uh, everybody knows that one right um uh you know and everyone knows you know talking a big line and not delivering you know um all these things um you know it's about uh personal liberation really and even i you know i haven't quite uh, found the talking points but like from my the point of view of my um character he almost has he has a little arc too, you know. This is a guy that's uh, that's had a very troubled past, but he's found a way to sp- spin it into something hopeful. And he has an arc, kind of like a parent does, you know, where it's nurturing and then pr- too pr- much protection, and then he lets it go, and then they come back. Um, but I don't know. It's a lot about um, being. Uh, being being free and not being oppressed by certain uh, sense of conforming to uh, societal norms, you know, making up your own mind, not taking your cues from the outside, but taking your cues from the inside. Also, it's really important in the movie that we know that she loves him. You know? I yeah, I don't know, I, but I think it's expressed. I mean, I watch those end scenes. The couple of they're quite brief, but. I'm very moved by them, and I can watch them maybe because of the makeup or something. And that last line is so beautiful. It's the most simple, prosaic thing in the world, but he says something like, this is very interesting. What is happening? You know, it's, it touches me. You know, it's like, whew, he's um, he's off, but he's led a life that brought him to that place where he sees. He sees, you know, what you know, his origin, who he is, where he's going, you know? And, and you know, movies like that are, are, are always inspiring because it gives us courage to not be oppressed by um, routine and, and things that are, uh, you know, just, just in, in, to try to find security, we cling on to things that really hurt us more than help us, that's all. Yeah. Well, Willem... Thank you for racing up 8th Avenue. Uh